Hi folks, it's Switchback. Having a list of what to pack for a backpacking trip is a critical step toward having a good trip. And this video is going to cover the basics along with several optional items. Exact items will vary, of course, based on the trip, the seasons, conditions, you know, weather expected, etc. I have videos about several of these items that go more in depth and I'll link those along with links to a lot of these items down in the description. It's a good idea to get weights on each and every item before you go. And this will also over time help you figure out what to pack and how, what to upgrade. And for smaller items, I'll use a food scale. And then for larger items, like my pack itself in its entirety, I will use a luggage scale. You may have heard the term base weight, and this refers to everything that you are either not wearing as far as clothes go, or that is not consumable, such as food, water, fuel. And this is gonna include the pack, it's gonna include your car keys, it's gonna include your phone. I include my trekking poles when I count my base weight. Now, one caveat if you're doing your weight of your fuel is that the canister is not a consumable, so you need to consider that in your base weight if you want to split some hairs. Again, worn weight is going to include your clothing. It's also gonna include your footwear, your hat, but not necessarily like if you're wearing a waist pack. So let's start with the clothing that you would wanna take with you. What are you gonna wear? Such as pants, shorts, socks, footwear. This is all very individual, of course. A shirt, underwear, bra, if you're a bra wearer. Maybe a belt, a second shirt, a hat. So when I say a second shirt, I like to layer shirts. I usually will do like a tank top and then a long sleeve shirt over that. And that gives me an opportunity to take off that outer layer during breaks or when I'm in camp, but I need the sleeves in order to not chafe with my pack. I also really like having better sun protection from the clothing rather than having to constantly reapply sunscreen. And of course, in cooler temperatures, you may need more layers. Footwear is gonna vary by the person and by the trip. Some people hike in boots, some in trail runners, and a few even do it in sandals. Do what works for you. Most people like to have a hat. I like to wear a trucker's hat. And so you can also wear a sun hat or something else with more coverage. And of course, something warmer if it's really cold out. For the most part, you're going to wear the same clothes day in and day out during a backpacking trip. The exception to that would be your socks and your underwear. And usually you'll have one pair to wear and one pair to wash, and maybe a second pair of socks to sleep in that's separate from any that you're hiking in. This is easily the area that is most overpacked, especially by new backpackers, because you know we're used to packing for a regular camping trip or any kind of trip where you have a change of clothes for every day not the way it rolls on a backpacking trip. One item I highly recommend carrying is a buff, and I use this in hot temperatures and cold temperatures. It offers some sun protection and cold protection. I've even tucked it up under my trucker cap for some sun protection. You can dunk it in a creek or otherwise wet it down to help you cool down and put it around your neck. You can put your hair out of your face. I'm gonna get my buff back on so I can actually breathe. Can make it easier to breathe in high winds, keep dirt out of your face. I even use mine as a pillowcase, and you can even use it as a water pre filter if you wanted to. Your insulation layer is again going to vary widely based on the expected conditions on your trip. And so you may want a puffy or a fleece for the top, and if it's going to be really cold, you might want insulated layers for the bottom as well. You may just need light layers, or you might need to bundle up and have a hat and balaclava and mittens or gloves and as your budget allows having different kinds of coats that you can wear you know taking a heavier coat for a cold trip versus a standard puffy and a puffy refers to a down or synthetic filled jacket unless you're going for a very short trip and are 100 percent confident it is not going to rain it's a good idea to at least have a rain jacket but you may want a full set of rain gear with either a rain pants or a rain skirt, regardless of your gender. And of course, you're gonna consider the temperatures as well. A Pacific Northwest rain in the 40s versus in Florida in the 80s, you're gonna want different gear. Having separate sleep clothes will protect your sleeping bag or your quilt. You're gonna want something that you haven't been hiking in all day, ideally, to protect from the oils and the salts. In cold temperatures, I'll add down booties and I'll take covers for putting them on when I I need to get up to go pee at night. Maybe a warm hat, mittens, balaclava over my face if it's really cold. 
but I do everything I can to avoid sleeping in my coat. Sleeping in your coat can actually interfere with staying warm and then when you get out of your bed, you don't have something nice and warm to put on afterwards. But I will put my coat in my sleeping bag or my quilt. Some of us are bigger fans of sunglasses than others. I fall into the category of need them for every trip. A few optional items that I pretty much always carry. The first one is going to be camp shoes. It is so nice to change out of the shoes you've been hiking in all day when you get to camp. They can also be nice for water crossings unless you have a lot of water crossings, in which case you're probably just gonna wear your regular footwear. I used to wear these Teva sandals, but I found that they were not supportive enough and my feet would actually hurt more in camp wearing these than just wearing my hiking shoes. So I eventually upgraded to some Chacos and I like that I can still wear my socks with these and they have good support. They have an ankle strap so that if I'm going through a water crossing, I'm good on that. But one of the more popular options out there is a pair of Crocs. They don't have to be sparkly like these. But having that heel strap might be kind of nice during those water crossings too, and you have some toe protection. And these can easily just be stuck on the outside of your pack. I really love my Dirty Girl gaiters for keeping rocks and dirt and stuff like that out of my footwear. Depending on the conditions, you may need snow or sand gaiters to keep you know, snow and sand out of your footwear as well. Very few trips require snake gaiters. I have fallen in love with my sun gloves. They keep my hands from getting hot spots from my trekking poles and our hands are exposed all the time. And it's really easy to forget to put sunscreen on if you're wearing long sleeves. So having sun gloves is pretty nice. I always take two or more bandanas and go for the good cotton ones, not the cheap polyester ones at the dollar store. And I use one for dirty water, fil you know, pre-filtering my water for grabbing my pot, that kind of thing. And another one for blowing my nose because my nose runs like crazy on a backpacking trip. Now on to cooking food and water. So of course you're going to need food unless you're out for two hours or less or something like that but there's a variety of meals out there or you can make your own, whatever works for you. Unless you're confident that the water is safe where you're going, you're gonna need some kind of water filtration and or treatment. I highly recommend having a backup on this. My Sawyer is my primary and I use this with a CNOC bag. And then my Aquamira is my backup. Now be mindful that if the temperatures are going below freezing, then you need to protect something like this against freezing, which will damage your filter. And I have, instead of using this in the snow, melted frozen, you know, melted frozen snow, like because there's non-frozen snow, also known as water. Um, I have melted snow for drinking water, but this burns through a ton of fuel unless you are burning a fire. In my case, I ran out of fuel and ended up grateful that I had my Aquamira. You're gonna need some way to carry said water and you can use a reservoir or bladder that's in your pack and I have this video up here to show you how to fill it without taking it out of your pack. You can use a Nalgene despite what some judgy people might say about it or you can use something like a smart water bottle or other commercial water bottle. Some people even find a way to rig this up with a hose. There's all kinds of stuff out there about that. If you do go with this option, consider carrying a couple of extra caps in case one goes was missing, you might be grateful for that one on the trail. Again, a bandana, even a towel. I use this one just for clean. So if I've washed dishes, this is strictly for clean. No dirty water ever touches this, but I'll use my bandana for drying my hands. Like if I've washed my hands with filtered water, I will dry them with this. And if you are taking bandanas, take different colored ones so that you can keep them straight. Food storage. I am a big fan of the bear canister because I am usually in the Sierra or somewhere else with bears that are not very well behaved and often don't have a lot of fear of humans. So depending on the conditions that you're going to be in as far as what the wildlife is, what the trees are like, what, the regulations are where you're going. You can take a bear bag with a hanging kit. You can use a rat sack. You can use OPSEX inside of those to keep the odors down. OPSEX stands for odor proof sack. You can use an ur sack, which I am not a fan of for multiple reasons. <laughs> Quickly of those, I have a video about my bear canisters down below, but a bear can still trash your food and leave you foodless. 
out on the trail. Some places have bear poles or bear storage boxes. Most places have nothing, but again, look and see what is available to you where you're headed. Look at the rules and regulations because some places do require that you take a bear canister. A lot of people do sleep with their food, but again, know the behaviors of the animals where you're headed, including rodents, including, you know, skunks and ice and all kinds of fun things that are out there. Not to mention the bears, of course. And don't forget that all smellables, including your toothpaste and all kinds of fun things, need to go in with your food bag or your food canister. If you're planning to eat while you're out on the trail, you're gonna need some kind of a utensil. And so I personally like a long spoon. This is the closest thing I will do to a spork right here. Depending on how you're cooking, you may even need a travel spatula or tongs or other things like that. But this right here is where a long spoon is really nice. Your hand gets a lot less dirty than trying to eat this with this. Not everyone chooses to take a stove. There are lots of different ways to go stoveless. If you're allowed to build fires, you can cook over a fire. You can choose to cold soak or eat everything ready to eat. You know, that's like bars and that kind of thing. But there are lots of different kinds of stoves out there and it's important to know what's allowed where you're headed. For example, here in California, alcohol stoves not allowed. And if you are taking a stove, be sure to get the right kind of fuel. For example, this particular stove, there is an adapter kit to put it with a canister, but usually we're gonna want white gas. However, these ones that screw on, these are gonna go onto a canister, it doesn't matter the brand, they can mix and match, it's okay. But whatever you do, get the right one for your stove. How much fuel you're gonna take, it's just gonna be trial and error. It's gonna depend on the conditions, how often you're planning on heating stuff up, if you're taking coffee, are you warming up lunch? So this is just gonna take time and experience, but I will say that do not take these. These are great for refilling these ones. I have taken these, but they are definitely excessive. My personal average is about one ounce per day, including my coffee, breakfast, and dinner, but again, your mileage may vary. If you're gonna use a stove or you're gonna burn over a fire, then you're gonna need some kind of a cook pot. If you're just boiling water, a titanium pot will totally do the job or if you're making soups, that kind of thing. But if you're actually cooking, like ask me how I know not to make scrambled eggs in titanium and they taste scorched, it's not something I highly recommend. I would use my aluminum set for that. But if you're cooking from scratch, you may want a pan rather than a pot. You can figure out what's right for whatever you're planning on cooking. For me, coffee is a must and I like to have a separate cup because I like to sip on that while I heat up my water for my breakfast. I prefer instant coffee so that I don't have to pack out grounds or take anything in order to filter it. I'm not a fan of cowboy coffee and just really don't like getting grounds in my coffee. And again, if you are taking grounds, pack them out, please. They do not belong out in nature. I like to carry a small sponge with me, although you can actually just use your toothbrush. But even if I'm just cleaning my spoon, it's really nice to have. Now, if you have multiple people going on your trip with you, it's a good idea to have bowls, plates, um, you can get some lightweight stuff like this. I grew up taking a Frisbee because, you know, you always want things to have more than one purpose. Another thing if you're rehydrating meals like this is having an insulated pouch to put them in. And I often use an Amazon pouch, one of those white and blue ones that come for free with half of the stuff that you buy. Or you can make one with Reflectix like I've done or you can buy one already made. But these are really nice to have. Pop it in, seal it up, stand it up. This one can actually stand in theory like that. Also makes a nice seat. I also like to carry my food for the day in a little mess sack. This is actually the sack that these bowls and plates came in but I like to have this on the outside pouch of my pack and that way all of my food for the day is out in there. 
but just don't forget to put it back in your bear canister or your bear bag at night. You'll also want to be mindful if you go with this approach, if this is going to be in the sun, you don't want to have things like cheese or chocolate or other things that can melt and get nasty in there. I know we like to get out on the trail to avoid our electronics. However, we end up taking electronics. So let's cover some of those. Odds are you're taking your phone with you and your phone can also triple as a camera and your GPS device. Now, very few places that most of us backpack have good service. And so if you want to save your battery on your phone, put it into airplane mode and battery saving mode. There are also lots of other good strategies. I'll cover those in another video. And I have several videos about having satellite communication with you. In fact, I have a whole playlist right up here all about satellite communication. And there are several brands out there. I like my Garmin InReach Mini, but there are newer models that InReach has or that Garmin has. There's also the Bivy Stick, the Zolio. Um, there's some different ones out there. Arguably optional, but I would argue that it's not, is a headlamp. You're gonna want at least two sources of light and your phone, again, multiple purposes, can be your backup. But you're gonna want, again, some sort of light source. Very few people take a flashlight anymore. I like having one that's rechargeable. This is my old one. I've been using this one for a really long time. It is falling apart but um, this is also rechargeable, which is nice. They're both very bright. If you're gonna be out more than just one night, you're probably gonna need a power bank. I have several of these. These are the first power banks I got. Don't go solar, ever. But if you're gonna be taking lots of pics or videos like some people do, if you're using your GPS a lot, you're gonna go through a lot of battery. And so having a power bank is really nice to have. And I have a video down below talking about the two of these. And over time, this Evatronic has actually kind of won my heart. And it has more juice to it than my Anchor. And it has a USB-C outlet, which is really nice. And so speaking of those outlets, you're gonna need cables to plug into said outlets. And you're gonna need to have them for whatever items you're carrying with you. Whether it's your headlamp, your GPS, your, um, you know, your inReach or your phone, any of those kinds of things. If you're taking Bluetooth headphones, be mindful what you need to take with you. But go through your cables, look for the lightweight short ones and make sure that they all work first. I have taken a mini USB that did not work. That's not fun. And going back to headphones, take headphones. If you're going to listen to anything, and again, there's arguments for, arguments against, but the other people on the trail will be grateful that you have your headphones. Keep them low so that you can hear what's around you. Keep one out of your ear, whatever works, but stay aware of your, of your surroundings. Now, Bluetooth ones will actually drain your battery faster. And so I use my plug in just, you know, uh, Apple earbuds. I do like to listen to stuff sometimes out on the trail. I'm a big fan of podcasts personally. One optional item, and I would argue maybe not so optional, is going to be my Flextail Gear Tiny Pump. And this weighs about the same as a pump sack, but you can also use it for, so in, in addition to inflating your sleeping pad, which again can, may come with a sleep, a, an inflation sack, but should never really be inflated orally, you can use it to uh, stoke your fire. You can use it to even like blow stuff out of your tent. If you really want to, you can use it to dry your hair, whatever works for you. Ultimately, it's a pretty low weight penalty. Another optional item is going to be a tripod or a selfie stick. And not just YouTubers carry these. I have been carrying one for years and you know, most of my trips are solo. It's really nice to be able to take pictures out on the trail in front of something beautiful, instead of in front of a lake, in front of a mountain, and whatever's pretty out there. And just to, you know, have a little tripod, the, you know, these work as a tripod as well. And, you know, you can stick it wherever, take pictures of yourself, put it on a timer, take a video, whatever works. And there are tons of them out there, lots of good options. I like this one because it is really, really long. Most of them are not quite this long. They're usually like maybe there. For 18 grams, I really love having a little portable thermometer with me. 
and I leave this one on for my whole trip. I can see what the highs, the lows are. It's kind of nice. Now you can't always smell beautiful out on the trail, but there is some element of hygiene that is necessary. So let's start out with, you're gonna want hand gel, and I am leaving it on my pack because it's a pain in the butt to take off. But I just refill this from a big thing of it that I keep in my bathroom. Very handy. However, if your hands are visibly dirty, you're going to want to use soap and water. Whoop. That's not how you do that. Okay. I highly recommend taking some kind of a biodegradable soap, but even if it's biodegradable, take it at least 200 feet from any existing or potential water source. This can actually be used for your hands, your laundry, your dishes, if you wanna bathe things. But it's also nice that it's a little Nalgene bottle, so even after you're done with this, you can reuse it, throw it in the dishwasher, reuse it for your olive oil or whatever else. I generally transfer this into a smaller, lighter container. You'll also want some way to brush your teeth, and you can take toothpaste, tooth tabs. I take a little travel toothbrush. Some people cut the end off of their toothbrush to make it smaller and easier to pack. There are also these teeny tiny ones that come from uh, garage going gear. I carry Q-tips for cleaning my ears and for first aid. And don't forget to put sunscreen on said ears. And again, your hands, your face, you're gonna want some sunscreen. Even if you have clothes that protect you from the sun, you can take a little bit less with you, but you're still gonna wanna take some. And don't forget if you are along, along the water a lot or over snow, you're gonna wanna get the underside of your chin and the underside of your nose. You may want a comb, a brush, hair ties, depending on your hair. I definitely carry me some chapstick on the trail. I really like this particular one right here, but these both have some SPF to them. So sun protection for your lips is important. Plus with the wind, the elevation, you're breathing hard, your lips are gonna get chopped. You will probably have to poop somewhere along the way. So you will need some kind of a poop kit. It should not include an entire roll of toilet paper things I've done before. You will want, at minimum, a trowel or a stake or something else to bury, you know, dig a hole for your poop. You're gonna want wipes, you're gonna want toilet paper, you're gonna want a Ziploc bag or something else to put all of that stuff into when you're done with it. Now, the other option is to carry something like a wag bag, which is if you have to carry out your poop or if you make that choice for yourself, which a lot of times I actually do these days. But instead of taking this, you can just undo this, you know, take some of this with you, not the whole thing. And then you can figure out how many poops you're gonna probably take and take at least as many wipes as you expect to have poops, but your patterns may be a little different than they are at home. You may also want some just to clean yourself in general. Now, something I just bought and have not yet tried is a Kulo Clean, and this is a portable bidet. And what this does is it screws onto something like this, or just pushes in, and then you fill that up and it squirts out right here. So I'll be trying this and giving y'all a full review, I'm sure. And I promise to keep it family friendly. Now one option after using something like that is to wipe with a Kula cloth. And if you're gonna use one to wipe when you go pee, also make sure that they look different so that you don't mix them up. But this can greatly reduce how much of this you have to haul around with you. I even use these at home now, which is why I have so many. If you are a menstruating person, then you're gonna need menstrual supplies potentially as well as appropriate and some way to pack them out because they should never be buried or burned. Now a handful of you are those lucky people who never ever chafe and good on you, but you never know when it's gonna strike. And in that case, you're gonna want some kind of anti-chafe. This is not usually what I take on the trail. This is usually what I use for cycling, but I definitely take my share of body glide. I also really like to have a little thing of hand lotion. I take some of this, squirt it into a smaller container, but my hands do get dry, especially up at elevation, so it's nice to have. Sometimes I'll just use a bandana with water to wash my face, but sometimes it's nice to have wipes, and I'll just pack however many of those I need for my trip, put it in a little Ziploc bag, 
and then pack those out with me. I also recommend carrying nail clippers or a nail file because it is super irritating to snag a nail on stuff and it can be painful. So having some way to fix that is really helpful. Next is your shelter and your sleep system. And so let's start with shelter. This could be a tent, it could be a hammock, it could be a tarp, it could just be a ground sheet and you can cowboy camp. You'll wanna take your poles, your stakes. Now, if you own multiple options, you're gonna to need to consider the regulations where you're going. For example, some places you can't tie ropes around trees, so no hammocks are allowed or there may not be enough trees that are close together where you can do that. Think about what the ground is like, what the weather is that you anticipate. So if there are high winds, snow, rain, is it gonna be bluebird conditions? Is it gonna be hot? Then you're gonna want some kind of a sleeping bag or a quilt. And if you take your quilt, you may want your quilt straps. And again, if you have multiple options, you're gonna to wanna to look at what are the conditions, where you're headed, what are the temps, is it really humid? If it's going to be very humid or there's lots of rain, you may wanna go with a synthetic option over down. And if you're hammocking, you may want an underquilt. If you're ground sleeping, you're definitely gonna want a sleeping pad of some kind. And you want it to have at least a little bit of insulation and think about what, again, temps that are that you're anticipating and the ground can really suck the heat out of you. So that higher R value means more insulation. It can be more critical than you may realize. And that's even in warmer weather, but at least a little bit of insulation is good then. But in the winter, of course, you're gonna want more of it. Some people just use a stuff sack with clothes or jackets or whatever for a pillow, but I sleep so much better when I take a pillow. And I have a little hack that I do. Again, I'll put that link down in the description for the short video of how I do that. One option if you need to beef up the warmth of your sleeping bag is using a sleeping bag liner. Now I have found that these offer about a third of the claimed warmth that they report. And I have found better success using a top layer rather than those liners. So I just take an old synthetic uh, sleeping bag opened up on top, much warmer, much easier to get in and out of because those things are like body condom, if you will. But they're just, you have to slink in and out of it every time you get up to go pee at night. It's exhausting. But the Eco Pro sleeping bag that I have had for like seven or eight years, it's like $30 maybe, absolutely worth it. I have more than gotten my money's worth out of that. It has saved me on some trips. Next category is what I call survival and tools. It is critical if a permit is required where you're headed that you obtain one. The money goes toward the natural spaces that we enjoy. It lets um, park rangers know who is out there in the event of say a wildfire or other natural disaster. It helps with quotas and reducing the overuse of these natural spaces that we love, especially in those really popular places. In California, if you plan to use a stove, you're going to need a campfire permit, even if you're not building a campfire. And sometimes this is actually included in your use permit. Either way, it's free. You will need, of course, a pack. And I am not going to go into everything that you need to choose what pack is right for you in this video. But again, if you have multiple pack options, think about the conditions that you're going to be in, how big you need it to be, how well it carries the kind of load that you're going to be taking. There are a wide variety out there. It's a good idea to choose your other gear first to ensure that it will work but that you're also not going any bigger than you need, says the girl with an 80 liter pack. You don't need 80 liters. You'll need a first aid kit of some kind. It doesn't have to be terribly robust, just get you through the normal, you know, cuts, scrapes, bruises, burns, etc. that most of us encounter on a trip. It doesn't have to, you know, do advanced life support. And definitely don't carry a bunch of stuff that you don't know how to use. And I know that there's an argument for, you know, if someone comes across you and they know how to use that thing, they're probably carrying it with them if they know how to use it. And they're probably not gonna know where yours is to use on you magically to know. So not worth it. I'm an RN, it all fits in here. And I know how to use all kinds of stuff. 
but I really carry about the same stuff that I would recommend that you carry. You'll wanna carry any medications that you use on a daily or as needed basis. And I talk about my medications that I use in my first aid kit in my first aid kit video, which again, I will link up here and down there, but anything that you're taking on a regular basis or as needed absolutely should be going with you. A knife can be handy for several things. I have never needed anything bigger than this. I've definitely never needed a bushcraft knife, but this, this is going to be much safer than say the blade on here which is not really a locking blade and so it can easily cause problems this is handy for certain things this is about as big as you're going to need though a signal mirror can be very helpful in the case of an emergency and you point this at the horizon with the sun flashing on it to try to get some attention this is also helpful for looking for ticks in places that are hard to see naturally. It's always a good idea to carry a mylar blanket. This can be added warmth as a, an emergency blanket or emergency shelter. I have used it over my sleeping bag before, but be mindful that that will lock in the moisture and it will be damp and your bag will be damp in the morning if you do that. So last night I got a little chilly, so I pulled out my emergency blanket and threw it over myself. And I noticed when I pulled out my sleeping bag that it was a bit wet here. And I didn't think about the fact that it's got condensation from being under this. Just like I carry two ways of filtering and treating water, I also carry at least two ways to start a fire, even if I'm not somewhere that I'm gonna be starting a fire necessarily. Normally I have at least a lighter and matches, but sometimes I carry my ferro rod as well and a pocket bellow, although you can also use your flex tail gear pump either way to get a fire going. It's a good idea to know how to use a compass properly and carry one with you. And with that, you'll want your map of wherever you're headed. I always carry a hard map whenever ever possible carry a paper map. Sometimes GPS maps have illegal trails on them. This will tell you what's actually official. And I know I like to stay on the legal trails as much as possible. Now I leave my wallet at home instead of leaving it in my car or packing it with me, but I carry my ID, a credit card or two, and a little bit of cash always. The cash in case I need to hitch a ride or just need emergency cash in some small town somewhere. Credit cards mostly for the ride up and down to the trailhead and back and ID in case of whatever. I always take my car keys with me and I've heard too many horror stories about people's cars getting broken into or their car being stolen when they've left them in a box under their car, under their wheel well or wherever they put it. So I am more comfortable just carrying mine with me. And I used to use one of those when I was a surfer. I don't do that anymore. Tenacious tape is critical to have. I really like this for repairing. If I need to repair my jacket, my sleeping bag, my tent, pretty much anything, my sleeping pad, although I carry the patch kit with that, any rain gear, anything like that, etc. An umbrella might sound a little extra, but it is really nice when the sun is beating down on you to have that protection. And of course, if it rains, nice to have not so nice in high winds a head net insect repellent especially in the spring but familiarize yourself with the conditions where you're headed and when they tend to be buggy the spring melt is a very common time in the sierra for mosquitoes a sleep mask another thing that might sound a little extra but if you're trying to sleep in if the moon is really full if you're trying to go to bed early and the sun is out until 9 30 at night it's kind of nice to have a sleep mask a chair definitely optional but it can be really nice to have something to lean back on when you've been hiking all day rather than just sitting on a rock or a stump. Now think about how much downtime you're really going to have if you have kids with you. Then you may want to take books. Some people even take watercolors, a fishing pole, a journal, a pen, playing cards, magazine. Obviously take whatever's relevant for you personally. I love using my trekking poles. If there is any kind of incline or decline, critical. They save my knees, they help distribute the effort going uphill, and they have saved me from so many tumbles, especially during water crossings. And of course, having a trekking pole tent very nice to be able to put it up. Sometimes I'll also take a few spare carabiners, just little ones, 
but they can be useful for all kinds of things. Now that you have a list of what you're gonna need, where are you headed? Well, I have these videos here to help you plan that. I hope you get out there and have a blast doing it. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Hi folks, it's Switchback. I, well, okay, just, yeah. Spo these are not spoons, these are bowls. Ah, that was not my best.